This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. In Canada, the energy sector is going through a major transition. As a nation, Canada has set ambitious targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and has made a commitment to prioritize the environment and climate action. Multiple levels of government and government agencies play an integral role in Canada's net zero initiative. So, who is developing policies and programs to promote the sustainable development of Canada's natural resources, including clean energy? Natural Resources Canada is at the forefront of Canada's movement, working on initiatives that empower provinces and territories to decide their economic priorities while reducing greenhouse gas emissions through regional priorities and projects that align with Canada's net zero goals. Recently, the Royal Bank of Canada stated that the electricity sector is net zero ready, but notes that it will require doubling, maybe even tripling the electricity output that currently exists today. This requires not only addressing the technical and economic challenges of transitioning to clean energy, but also creating social and cultural change. So here is today's big question. Can Canada successfully achieve its net zero goals while creating a sustainable and prosperous future for all Canadians? Joining me today is Debbie Scharf, Assistant Deputy Minister at Natural Resources Canada. In her role, Debbie is responsible for spearheading one of the Government of Canada's signature energy initiative, the transformation of regional energy systems through the Regional Energy and Resources Tables. She also oversees the sector's Electricity Resources Branch and the Energy Policy and International Branch, both of which are integral to the Government of Canada's central energy initiatives to realize a net zero future. Debbie, so great to have you join us today. Perhaps you can start by telling our listeners about Natural Resources Canada, better known as NRCAN, and its objectives. Yeah, so Dan, thanks so much for inviting me here today. It's it's really great to, to talk a little bit about some of these issues with yourself and for your listeners. Um, so uh, NRCAN is, a, is one of many federal departments, but our role specifically is to work to improve the life of Canadians by ensuring our natural resources are developed sustainably, hence the name of our department. And we do this Um, in ways, for example, supporting climate change mitigation and advancing the net zero transition, using our natural resources to provide a source of jobs, prosperity, and opportunity for Canadians, of course, preserving our environment and those natural resources, and respecting and engaging with Indigenous peoples towards economic reconciliation. And so that really sums up very much the heart of what NRCAN is about. How is Natural Resources Canada integral to Canada's initiative to achieve a net zero future? Yeah. Well, I'd say NRCAN is pretty integral because 80% plus of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions comes from producing and using energy. And NRCAN is the department responsible for energy, at least federally. And so we play a very, very important role in the journey to get to net zero. And we try and use all of the tools that we have available as a department, which includes things like policies and regulations, funding programs, science partnerships, to help shape and accelerate that transition. And you know what, we're not just focused on emissions. We often talk about emissions when we talk about the net zero transition, but we also think a lot at NRCAN about how to create new economic opportunities that will create jobs for Canadians, good paying, sustainable jobs, and to position Canadian businesses to be the supplier of choice for energy globally and provide those energy services and security to the rest of the world. I just will say one thing, and I said the point federally, is because energy is a shared jurisdiction in this country, and that is pretty important. So as a department, part of an integral role of what we do is working collaboratively with our provincial and territorial counterparts and Indigenous partners to do the work that we do, and of course, with a variety of stakeholders across the country. Debbie, now, with respect to the environment and climate action, what is Canada already doing right? 
Well, I would say the one thing that is worth noting as a starting point is that over the past two decades, we've seen a decoupling of economic growth and GHG emissions. And I think that really speaks to the fact that there are things that are going right when it comes to energy and and climate. There have been a number of technology improvements that we've seen, regulations that have been implemented. And of course, although not under the purview of Enercan, uh, a pollution carbon charge or tax that has been applied across the country all of which have helped to tackle emissions and help get them on a different trajectory. And so I do think that we're on the right track. I do, if you don't mind, highlight sort of three kind of sets of things that we're doing when we talk about, are we doing things right? And the first one is putting in place a plan. Uh, Now, the government of Canada put in place a series of climate plans, but most recently the emissions reductions plan in 2022, because if you don't have a roadmap, to know where you wanna go and how you're gonna get there, how are you gonna know if you're achieving success and you're doing the right things? So I think putting in place a really solid plan that gives us that roadmap has been something we're doing right. The other important thing is getting getting the right investment. How do you attract investment into the sorts of industries, technologies that we need to see Canada prosper as we move to, to net zero? And the most recent federal budget with a number of tax credits, which I'm sure we'll get into over the course of our chat, is an area where we're sort of moving the bar around investment attraction and collaboration. As I said before, shared jurisdiction. We are not doing anything in this country when it comes to climate and energy, unless we are working in partnership with other jurisdictions and with a broad range of stakeholders and of course our Indigenous partners. Okay, now you've taken a new and prominent role as the Assistant Deputy Minister for NRCAN. Can you tell us a bit more about your role? Yeah, and I feel very privileged to be in this role uh, at Enercan and and enjoying it very much. Uh, So in my particular role, I'm focused on, frankly, transforming Canada's energy system through policies, programs and regulatory solutions to try and get to that net zero economy, but very critically while ensuring affordability, reliability and security of energy. So it's a bit of a trifecta set of outcomes that we're driving towards and how you bring all of that together is really at the heart of what my role is at Enercan. Um, And I oversee a large variety of files, but just to highlight a few that, that may be interesting. Uh, First, I'm responsible for electricity sector and nuclear fuel cycle issues within the the federal family. We have our resource uh, regional energy and resource tables, which are new collaborative partnerships with provinces and territories. And I'm happy to talk a bit about that to advance economic opportunities. Of course, the recently launched sustainable jobs plan, very connected to how we transform our industries and create those jobs. Um, And so we provided leadership around that. We do some international work on equity, diversity and inclusion because we want to build the right energy sector of the future. And we do things like just providing that core energy data to Canadians like our energy fact books so people can understand the energy sector in Canada. So those are all things that I do in my sector amongst other things. Great segue here. Okay, so you're spearheading the regional energy and resources table. What is their purpose specifically? So that's a great question. So the regional tables are a really different approach that the federal government is taking, and they're very focused on how do you drive economic benefit and economic prosperity in the context of transitioning to net zero. And when it comes to a country like Canada, and when it comes to energy, where you live matters. A Quebecer is not facing the same type of issues as someone in Alberta or British Columbia or Prince Edward Island. And so energy is a very regional issue. The challenges that each region of the country will face in the transition is different. And frankly, the economic opportunities in each region of the country is also going to look a little bit different. And so the regional tables are really about how do we accelerate those economic opportunities on a jurisdiction or a regional basis, understanding that these issues are going to be felt differently depending on where you live. And if I can quote Minister Wilkinson just for one moment, although he's not subject to this podcast, but it is it is a very key comment. Um, he talks about the need to be strategic, ambitious, and collaborative. And those are really the words that I would use to describe what, what underpins what we're trying to achieve with the regional tables. Can you help me better understand how the regional tables will empower provinces and territories to decide their economic priorities? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So the starting point for the regional tables, uh, regardless of what jurisdiction we're talking to you, is to decide on a small number of priority areas where we think that as governments working with Indigenous partners and stakeholders, we can accelerate and make demonstrable progress in the near term and into the future. So we can't do everything under the sun, but can we find three or four priority sector or priority areas where the province or the, or the territory would like to partner with the federal government to accelerate progress? So that is really the starting point. And then the goal is, as governments, how can we align our resources, our timelines, our decision making, our regulatory processes to accelerate the development of those priority areas, i.e. those industries. Um, and as governments, we have a tremendous ability to do that better, uh, to be able to make that kind of progress. And so very tangibly, it's really about coming together and having discussions around, okay, if I'm British Columbia and, and I want to build a hydrogen economy, what's standing in the way of doing that? What would be our objectives around what we'd like to see happen in British Columbia? And what are the sorts of tangible actions we can take together to be able to accelerate that progress? And that is really step one. There's, there's more steps to the regional table that there's very that is very much step one to be able to to move these forward and uh, that's very much where we're focusing our efforts right now okay let's get just a bit in the weeds here debbie can you tell our listeners more about who the participants are at the regional tables beside the federal provincial and territorial governments yeah and so, you know, the theme of collaboration, I think, will be a thread throughout uh, many of my answers. But collaboration is a very, very, and partnership, frankly, is a very important part of the regional tables. So, uh, you know, you've heard me express that the starting point is this is this relationship between governments. The other incredibly important feature to the regional tables is a partnership with um, Indigenous communities and, and partners in the jurisdiction. And, you know, just like energy has a very different landscape across the country, the Indigenous landscape is also very different depending on what part of the country you live. In. And so we're designing very specific ways of partnering with Indigenous organizations and communities in each province so that ultimately we hope that we could have more of a trilateral type of discussion around how to accelerate these priorities. So that's another important feature of who are these partners at the table. The other piece is there's a number of stakeholder groups out there that, that have expertise, whether it be industry, partnerships with union and labor groups who are interested in understanding how we're going to build the jobs of the future, think tanks that are really considering so many long-term challenges in this space. Um, so universities, there's a large range of stakeholders that want to be able to participate in this process. And we're finding ways to do that as well, because at the end of the day, we want to understand how to accelerate change, and we need to have all those perspectives brought to bear. And so we're designing that type of input and partnership into the process as well. Okay, moving on here. Maybe you can tell us how federal funding from existing sources can be directed towards top regional priorities and projects. Yeah, so this is a really important piece because uh, if the idea is that through these discussions, you've identified what are your priorities, what are your objectives, and therefore, what are the types of projects that we need to advance in those jurisdictions, you could start to develop a pretty clear priority list around where you want to catalyze investment and how public and private sector dollars can be brought to bear. And that is exactly sort of when we talk about how do we align our programming, it's really about these tables being able to provide a sense of what are those priorities that we need to invest in, and then how can we bring the programs in the federal family to bear to help facilitate those program investments. And there are a number of programs that we have that exist within the federal government, whether it be the Strategic Innovation Fund Net Zero Accelerator, the soon to, to, to be brought to fruition Canada Growth Fund, uh, the Infrastructure Bank, the Critical Mineral Strategy that had quite a bit of funding attached to it. So these are all areas that we're looking at to say, how do we match, you know, where public funding can support priority investments and the tables are servicing where those priorities are. Debbie, can you expand on how the approach to net zero emissions and a nature positive future will be different across the country. Uh, so it's it's really interesting. I, I have a, another thread that you're, you'll hear throughout the discussion around regional tables is the no one size fits all approach or where you live matters uh, type of idea. And so, you know, what we're finding is that there's a lot of consistency in the priorities that different jurisdictions across the country are interested in um, in pursuing, but they look very different depending on where you live. I'll give you a, a very obvious example. If you want to talk about carbon capture and storage and you live in Alberta, 
that's a very different conversation than if you're in Newfoundland and you have an industry like an oil and gas industry that exists in the offshore. The, the type of conversation you're going to have will be very different uh, in terms of what types of actions you have to take to move that type of technology solution forward. Um, the same thing could be said around to, you know, uh, fuel sources like hydrogen. If you live in an Alberta or Saskatchewan, you may produce hydrogen a bit differently than if you were in Quebec uh, or in Manitoba. And so it's very interesting to see even how common priorities can find their expression very different depending on where you live. In Canada, where do you see the biggest opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in nature? And where do you see the biggest opportunities in technology? Yeah. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about carbon capture uh, and storage or carbon capture utilization and storage, CCS or CCUS, as a great example for Canada. We have an enormous amount of natural advantages in this space, and it is going to be a very important technology for Canada to be able to reduce emissions. And think about those hard to abate sectors, not only oil and gas, but concrete steel, other types of industrial activities that need to capture emissions. And in Canada, we have wonderful geology of we have wonderful sort of natural strengths. Um, and we have a, an amazing industry and, and investments that have been made in this technology in years past that really put us in an, in an excellent position to take advantage of a technology like that. Um, and, and on the vein of CCUS, carbon capture as a concept is a very important opportunity area. And another example where you can capture carbon, but not necessarily through a technology is, for example, through our 2 billion trees program, where using nature to capture carbon is another uh, a, a very interesting way to, uh, to be able to tackle this while restoring nature and biodiversity and having a number of other positive impacts. So I'd say there's a lot to say for carbon capture technologies and a lot of reasons why it's a unique opportunity area for Canada. Now, staying on this topic of net zero, which sectors are most likely to achieve net zero first? That's a very hard question because uh, it's going to be a tricky path, I think, for all sectors uh, because each one is going to have its its own unique challenges to get to net zero. To so like when I think about it, because we talk a lot about reducing emissions in different sectors, I like to start by talking about the energy mix that actually underpins all sectors and how do you get that energy mix to be clean, reliable, and affordable? Uh, because without that, you're not going to get any sector to actually adopt those clean energy sources. So it is worth starting with electricity where we've made significant headway and is probably the front runner in Canada as a sector in terms of reducing emissions with the phase out of unabated coal fired um, electricity uh, generation happening in 2030, where Canada is an international leader. That sector is 83% clean um, and growing. And we have a commitment to, to get to net zero emissions in that sector by 2035. But what I will say, that's an enormous progress, an enormous progress that will be made going forward. But now we have to look at getting clean electricity to more people and more industries. And that will be a challenge in and of itself. Um, the other part of the energy system that, that's definitely worth attention and will be so important are clean fuels like hydrogen, because we know that some industries and application will not be able to use electricity or are going to need to use clean fuels. So I like to think about how do we get the energy system in the right place? have it reliable, affordable, and clean. And then you have to get to adoption um, and getting each of the sectors to be able to adopt that. And, you know, then you get into another set of challenges around technology and industrial processes, which will, will be a challenge. But, uh, you know, I would say electricity probably is, is coming up at the top. How is NRCAN enabling a clean energy future through electrification? Yeah. And I think uh, electricity has has made its way into your podcasts in the past. It's a very, very important topic. And that's because there are experts that have estimated that the electricity system may need to double, maybe even triple by the time 2050 comes around. And that is going to be an enormous challenge for Canada, a nation building, frankly, challenge for Canada. Think about railroads. The transmission lines of today are the railroads of the past to be able to get electricity to where it needs to get to. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have the regional tables where we're talking about electricity City, um, infrastructure and investments there. And we're soon to launch the uh, Canadian Electricity Advisory Council, which was just previously called the Pan-Canadian Grid Council to help help us through some of these challenges. Uh, but maybe what I will say is perhaps not Enercan, but the government of Canada in terms of advancing electrification, I think it is worth just reiterating what was in our federal budget that was just um, announced a number of weeks ago, because there's there's some real game changers in there. For example, the introduction of a clean electricity tax credit, which is applicable to tax and non-tax entities. And to not use jargon, that means 
you're not a private sector company, it's still okay, which means utilities can actually get access to these tax credits, which is an enormous leap forward for the application of these, these tax credits, which will help with the investments required in the electricity sector. There's also new and enhanced low-cost financing uh, that's being brought to bear with um, commitments around how the Canada Infrastructure Bank will be spending its money and the Canada Growth Fund. And then, of course, the top-up to Enercan programming uh, to the tune of about $3 billion to help ensure critical projects get built. And even more important than having tax credits and strategic financing and targeted programs is that they're all going to work together and and really come together in an integrated way to support investment. And I think that is a major leap forward in terms of thinking about how to catalyze investment in this sector. Now, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see? I almost feel like the challenge and the opportunity is the flip side of one another um, because huge challenge, we got to build out the system. Um, Huge opportunity, we can build it out more flexibly, more reliably, we could bring more energy efficiency to bear, which by the way, will be critical to not overbuild the system, bring new technologies to bear like smart grid technologies, and leverage new possibilities like vehicle to grid storage for electric vehicles, talk about all those batteries that are going to be out there. All of those technologies are enormous opportunities. uh, But the flip side is we need a lot of electricity, and we got to build that out. And what I would say is at the heart of the challenge, is how do you find the balance between having a clean system, an affordable system, and a reliable system? And and, and making decisions to build things out in a way that balances those three things, I think is the challenge and the opportunity. To accelerate success, what other countries should Canada be looking to emulate or learn from? Yeah, that is a great point uh, because we are not going to get to net zero without learning from partners and others around the world. And there are a few, I think, sort of really good models out there of other countries. And you really need to look to the ones that are tackling similar challenges that we have here in Canada to see what we could learn from them. For example, you know, there's an EU model around integrating regional electricity trade. That could be really fascinating for Canada to learn from, given that we have fragmented provincial jurisdictions with different market and regulatory structures, and we got to find a way to connect the system together for the collective good. And there are countries like Australia that have quite a similar type of structure to their economy, being a large energy producer, but also wanting to tackle climate and having sort of similar constitutional um, divisions of labor with their states. And in fact, Believe it or not, Australia did something very similar to the regional energy and resource tables. It wasn't called that, but they were a model that we looked at before uh, before we landed the final design for that particular piece. So we do a lot of international engagement, bilaterally, multilaterally, because there's a lot to learn from others. Debbie, is it possible to transition to a net zero future without economic hardships in a carbon heavy sector? Can you give an example on how to achieve this? Well, to, to quote another saying that someone once uh, once mentioned before is the best way to predict the future is to create it. So I think we have to very consciously think about the future we want to create and how to diversify the industries that we have into new product lines, new clean energy opportunities um, in the way that we think about the activities we're going to take going forward. But you know, one example that I think is worth uh, picking up on is the work that we're doing on sustainable jobs in particular. And because this is an area that you can really get wrong and talk about hardship is an area that you absolutely don't want to get wrong. And so really looking at where where we want to see economic growth and how do you support workers to be able to be ready for the type of opportunities that are going to be available in the future. And um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that we did publish a first interim sustainable jobs plan earlier this year. February, and it talked about 10 key areas where we can make some demonstrable progress. And we already are making demonstrable progress to uh, to get the workforce ready for the future. And, and frankly, it will be a differentiator because you can't have economic activity without people working. And if you don't have the right labor market, um, there won't be investment decisions made by companies. And so I think that that is uh, one area that we have to get right. Now, the Royal Bank of Canada released a thought leadership piece last October that said, The electricity industry is net zero ready, but that we would need to double the electricity output that currently exists today. What are your thoughts on Canada's electricity sector, its readiness, and that assessment? So I already mentioned that Canada's grid is about 83% non-emitting, 
Having said that, though, there are five, a number of provinces where there's still a significant reliance on unabated fossil fuels, provinces like Alberta, Saskatchewan, some Atlantic provinces, Ontario. And so again, where you live matters when it comes to energy, because when it comes to being net zero ready, it's going to feel a bit different in those provinces than if you were Quebec or British Columbia. And so um, we have to really focus in on how to support uh, the jurisdictions that, that need to get there and will be faced with the greatest challenges. And I cannot emphasize enough like the scale of the challenge. Uh, we tend to use the word generational quite a bit. Perhaps we use it a bit too much, but it is very generational in nature just in terms of its size and scope. And so, you know, once again, to, to just you know mention that we know as a federal government, we need to be a constructive partner in the federation around these particular issues and to help those jurisdictions that need to help to get to where they need to be. And the tax measures in the budget are very good examples of how we do that, providing long-term, stable, predictable investment climate, and frankly, helping to reduce costs, which means reducing ratepayer impacts um, around these particular projects in the jurisdictions that are going to feel it the most. So do I think that we have the technology to get there? I do. Does that mean that it's going to be easy for those provinces and jurisdictions that have a long way to go? No, it will not be easy. Interesting. Is there a myth or misunderstanding about the energy transition or net zero that you wish more people understood? So this is a great question. So I'm, I'm going to answer it a little bit more from the perspective of what I worry about the most uh, when I think about the work that I do. And what I worry about the most is that we don't always appreciate that Canada is an energy producing nation. So we generate an enormous amount of wealth, security, cheap energy from our energy sectors. And in turn, we are providing the world with energy security. Not every country can say that. In fact, there's a fairly small number of countries around the globe that can say that. And But it puts us in a bit of a tricky position because we're producing a lot of energy for other people. And when we think about getting to net zero, that creates an interesting dynamic for Canada about how we get there. Um, I look at other countries like Europe, and um, it makes you realize that energy affordability and energy security is actually our battle to lose because those are things we have today, but in other country, they're, uh, countries, they're not things that they have. And we definitely don't want to, to end up in that particular situation. So we just have to think a little, I, I, I worry that people don't appreciate the challenge unique to Canada as an energy producer. And when we're thinking about the energy transition and when we design our policies, we have to think not just about emission reductions, but how do we continue to generate that wealth that prosperity and that security from the energy system. And we have to solve for all those complex outcomes for Canadians. Otherwise, we're not going to get it right and we're going to lose the battle. Finally, Debbie, how do you make the fight against climate change equitable and accessible for everyone to participate in? What's needed for all Canadians to buy in to the net zero plan? So a couple of things that I would say about this. The first thing is, all levels of government have to cooperate, right? Like we've got to get, we've got to get the collaborations and the partnerships right to be able to create the enabling conditions to get to where we want to go. I would say that for Canadians, um, in my sense is I would feel this and I do feel this personally. It is a very personal experience. I need to have a job. I need to put food on the table. I need to feel like I'm making the right choices. I need to feel like the government and the country is making the right choices. And so we just have to make sure that in all the things that we're doing, we're being mindful that these are outcomes that we need to be able to deliver for Canadians. And not only for the Canadians that are employed in the workforce, but for marginalized people, underrepresented groups, like how can we create a very inclusive Canada on the path to net zero? And I think if we can develop a vision and implement a vision for an inclusive, uh, secure, affordable, and prosperous Canada, then we're going to get the buy-in that we need. And uh, the trick is to, to, to be able to solve for all those things uh, really well. Lastly, we always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I am scared, but I am ready. <laughs> now, what are you reading right now? A historical fiction about World War II. Okay. What would you name your boat if you had one? Well, I am the eternal optimist, so I would name it Possibility. Now, Debbie, who is someone you truly admire? Easiest answer, my mother. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? Um, I would say watching my kids grow into adults. 
What has been the biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? Yeah, uh, so the biggest challenge I would say is actually supporting my children, who I think have borne the biggest brunt of pandemic choices in society. So I would say a real sort of personal experience around the pandemic. Okay, we've been watching a lot more Netflix and TV lately. What's your favorite movie or even show? Yeah, so right now, Firefly Lane and Night Agent, uh, which shows my bizarre ability to move between romantic comedies and action options. <laughs> Lastly, what is exciting you about your industry right now? Well, that's an easy question because I am pretty excited about this industry right now. I think we are in the middle of the most difficult but exciting time in the energy transition. And I'm actually feeling pretty privileged to play a part uh, on behalf of all Canadians to, uh, to try and get us there. Well, Debbie, this is it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Thank you for joining me today. If our listeners want to learn more about you, how can they connect? Well, the easiest way to do that is to send an email. Debbie Scharf, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Energy Systems Sector at Natural Resources Canada. Thanks again for joining me today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Cheers. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.